Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the California Master Plan for Aging Equity and Aging Advisory Committee meeting. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. This uh, webinar is available uh, through your computer, but you can also join by phone. The phone number is listed there. Um, you'll need the meeting ID and password. Live captioning is available as well as ASL interpretation. You should see our interpreter, Carol, on your screen and we'll kind of uh, be managing the spotlight there. Uh, closed captioning can be enabled by selecting the closed caption icon on your to uh, Zoom toolbar and uh, clicking enable subtitles. And finally, meeting slides, the transcript and recording will be posted online after this session. We are saving time uh, for public comment. If you're joining us by phone, you can press star nine on your dial pad to uh, be put in the queue and we'll unmute your line. Uh, if you're joining us from your computer, uh, you can use the raise hand feature again on your Zoom toolbar and that will add you to the queue. And as always, you can use and engage using the Q&A icon on your toolbar. And with that, I will pass it to Director Wayne. Thank you, Maria. And it's so wonderful to see um, both so many of our longtime partners, but also that the table continues to grow as we work on equity and aging together. Uh, we have new members of the committee, which we're going to welcome in a second, uh, but just want to say thank you and welcome and new members of the CDA team uh, on program on master plan. Uh, sorry, Carol, I'll slow down. Uh, so welcome to all of you as, the, as more of us uh, link arms to advance equity and, and address discrimination and disparities in aging. I'm really uh, grateful for the two topics we're going to address today. Um, this committee has a very, very, very important purpose, which is advising both the Department of Aging and the broader administration in how we center equity in all that we do, person-centered, equity-focused, and data-driven. So we have two hot topics that with all of you, we have um, developed uh, vaccines. Uh, of course, we are still uh, responding to the and um, recovering from the pandemic. Uh, and also the, our uh, deepening work serving all older adults and disabled adults, uh, including uh, the intersectionality with the queer community and LGBTQ plus. So, so grateful for at least those two conversations and uh, many, many more always have many action items and many learnings from our time together. So I believe we're gonna look at the agenda more, whoo, that's a dense slide. I will not read every word on it to you, but you're gonna hear a quick update from um, Amanda. It's dense because a lot's going on uh, about a, a quick overview of highlights on all the equity and aging um, progress. Very exciting. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned, we'll focus on uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, SOGI and um, LGBTQ issues in the first half of the meeting with a break and then come back and uh, hear more from our partners at DHCS and our CDA leadership team on vaccines. Uh, thank you, Rigo, for facilitating an open forum so we catch anything else that's new and different, uh, open to the public as always, and then uh, summarize the action that will come out of this. Uh, we want to discuss, we want to um, coordinate, but we also want to power action. So look forward to a productive two hours with all of you. With that, Amanda, introduce us to all of the folks who are here, um, old and new faces. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amanda Lawrence, Project Director for the California Master Plan for Aging. And we're going to go ahead and do a roll call. We, um, as you heard, have uh, been greeted, or we now have um, expanded the table, and we have a few new members here today. I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves as we go through this roster. Your names have an asterisk next to them. Um, we'll go through, I'll go through everyone's name, just say hello, hi, and if you're new, please um, share a little bit of your background and what brings you to the Equity and Aging Advisory Committee. So we'll start with Bernice Nunez Constant, Betsy Butler, I believe Betsy's going to try to join us a little later. I think she's traveling at the moment. Uh, Catherine Blakemore is also going to try to join us as she is traveling later. Um, Cheryl Brown. Derek Lamb. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Derek Lamb from ACC Senior Services. 
Hi, Derek. Um, do we have David Jax Kelly on the line? Hi, yes, I'm here and uh, grateful to be here. I'm from Palm Springs. I lead a group here called Let's Kick Ass for AIDS Survivor Syndrome in Palm Springs and looking forward to working with you people. I'm sorry, I'm not on video. I've tried to get online uh, another way and uh, so far my phone is the only thing that's working. Well, we're glad you could join us. Thank you for being here. Denny Chan. Hi everyone, Denny Chan from Justice and Aging. I use he, him, his pronouns. And Amanda, I think Cheryl's actually on. She just wasn't able to unmute herself in time. Okay, hi Cheryl. Uh, next we have Diana Murray. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay. I'm sorry, I was having trouble connecting. All right, welcome. Uh, Diana you. Murray okay. is a new member. Um, she cannot make it. She is traveling today as well. So we will meet Diana next meeting. Next slide, please. We have Donna Benton. Hello, everybody. Hi, Edie Yao. Hi there, Edie Yao from Alzheimer's Association. And here we have a new member, Elvira Castillo. Um, Elvira, go ahead and please introduce yourself. You're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, it is a, both an honor and a pleasure to be here and join your committee and such an illustrious uh, membership. I'm, I'm, I'm honored. Uh, my name is Elvira Castillo. I'm from Los Angeles. Uh, at the moment, uh, I'm up here in the, the Monterey Bay, camping with my family. So uh, I look ragged muffin like. But uh, I'm, uh, I retired last April. No, actually, my goodness, April 2019. I'm cu currently doing some volunteer work with um, uh, ARP. And also I sit in the board of a senior services um, organization in Los Angeles. So I try to keep active in, in, uh, in my field uh, where I worked for over 40 years in state, local, county and city of Los Angeles and federal government. So I have that perspective, but I also have a perspective of being uh, first generation um, and um, farm worker uh, up here in, um, in Gilroy, the godly capital of the world. And so I have that perspective that I hope I could bring to, to the table here and the opportunity that it presents itself. So thank you, I'm delighted. Thank you, Elvira. Um, next we have Gail Oram, another new member. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gail Oram. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I am a pharmacist by profession. Uh, I'm an academic by, I guess, calling, I would say. I am uh, on the faculty at Keck Graduate Institute, School of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, one of the seven Claremont colleges. Um, I teach uh, in the pharmacy school there. And in my role there, I'm also the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. My specialty, however, from practice is geriatric pharmacotherapy. And one of my biggest joys is teaching the course in uh, geriatric patient care uh, to our students who are getting ready to graduate. So I'm just really excited to be on this group. I think it's very important that our students learn for the future um, how to be advocates for everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Jeffrey Reynoso is unable to make it today, but he does send his greetings. Um, all right, another new member, Julia Yarbo. Julia, hi, welcome. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, and thanks so much for the invite to take part. My name is Julia Yarbo. I am based in Chico in Butte County, the real Northern California, as I like to say. And I was a caregiver to my mother for the last 20 years with the last five being the heavy lifting. Sadly, mom passed last year, but as a broadcast journalist by trade, one of my goals is to take a lot of the information that we have from the academic sector, the research sector, the governmental sector, and break it down into terms that I can uh, create content and information, stories, interviews to share with others so that they understand a little bit more about the realities facing caregivers and what they need to know, what they need to plan for, and also how they can get involved 
for advocacy. So I'm really excited to be part of this. Um, it's a passion for me. I know what I went through caring for my mom and I wanna to try to help as many other people as possible and change some of our frameworks so that we can make it better for all of us moving forward. So thank you. Thank you for being here, Julia. I'm really excited to have you. Kiara Pruitt. I know Kiara is on the line, but perhaps having some muting problems. Kiara, we. I am unmuted now. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everybody. So happy to be here today. It's been a while for me. I've been traveling. I got married while I was away and have some news to share after the presentations today. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Kira. Uh, Kevin Prindeville. Hi, everyone. Kevin Prindeville, Executive Director of Justice and Aging. Uh, really glad to be with you all again and to meet our new uh, members of the group as well. Okay. And Leandra Clark Harvey just called in from the airport. I'm not sure if she can connect audio right now. Probably not, but. Um, we're happy to have Leandra listening in and um, while she is in the midst of uh, landing at the airport and gathering her luggage. Next, we have Marcy Edelman. And Marcy's gonna be presenting a little later today. Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, Marielle Creasel. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Uh, Marielle Priesel with the Disability Community Resource Center. Um, I'm so glad to be um, able to join you today. Thank you. Marty Lynch um, sends his regards. He is unable to make it today, um, as well as Michael Murray, who is uh, in an all-day training. Um, Rigo Saborio. Hi, Rigo Saborio, President and CEO of St. Barnabas in your services, longtime member of the equity work group and uh, now the, uh, uh, the committee. So a uh, pleasure to be working with all of you. And uh, I'm especially thrilled to have our new members aboard. Welcome. <laughs> And we have another new member, Vincent, please introduce yourself. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here. My name is Vince Chrysostomo. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm Director of Aging Services at San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Um, and I've been someone who's been living with HIV for about 34 years. Um, let's see. And I've also, my day job, I feel, has been taking care of my parents for the last three years they've been in a nursing facility and today's actually the one year anniversary of my dad's passing. So um, I'm attending this in his honor. It's nice to meet everyone. Thank you, very nice to meet you. Um, that wraps up our roll call. I'm really excited about all of our new members have joined us today. You can tell we have added plenty of perspectives and some geographic diversity as well to the committee. So um, thank you for being here. And I can't wait to meet uh, Diana Murray, our other new member at our next meeting. I'm gonna go ahead and dive into just a few MPA equity related updates. Um, of course, there are there's plenty to update you on and we don't have nearly enough time. So I'm going to focus on that goal three area, um, equity and inclusion, not isolation. And um, I'll just share some budget highlights um, you know, the, the final budget came out after our last meeting with several investments for um, aging and in equity. Um, and we also have a progress report that we released just after this last meeting. So um, you can refer to the progress report and soon we'll post an MPA budget document to our website, which will have a much fuller version of um, the investments and then the progress that we have made. Um, first, I'll just start out with, um, in general, the goal area of equity and inclusion not isolation, is that there was significant budget investments here. Um, we have um, 106 million that came in for the adults or older adult recovery and resiliency investment. And so there's um, lots of investments here for several different sorts of services and programs to strengthen older adults recovery and resiliency um, from all of the severe isolation and health impacts that they have incurred due to staying home um, during the pandemic. There are things in that budget investment, such as behavioral health warm line, digital connections, legal services, home delivery and community center meals, um, family caregiving, and so much more. Um, and then additionally, we have here for um, strategy A within um, goal three, you can see that we received um, $20 million um, actually is being 
overseen by the Department of Social Services to implement um, some language access services, the language access initiative at the Health and Human Services Agency. Of course, CDA will be a part of that and improving how we provide our language, our services in various languages. Um, we completed our equity and aging webinar series after our last equity meeting. And that final webinar was um, featured rural um, services. So we had uh, guests from Butte, Humboldt, and Mariposa County discussing how to deliver culturally responsive and competent services in rural communities. And that's posted to our Equity and Aging Resource Center. Um, next slide. So. And so for uh, closing the digital divide, I have a couple updates here. Strategy B, CDA has distributed 4,000 iPads to low-income older adults who live alone. Um, and it comes with two years of dedicated training and technical assistance to best utilize that technology. Um, and we're also recruiting for a digital divide manager at CDA. So appreciate any assistance in getting that word out. Really important position to really help address that social isolation that older adults have um, incurred during the pandemic or and perhaps also just feel and experience um, in non-pandemic times. Um, we also have some associated budget investments with that, including 50 million um, for access to technology program for older adults and adults with disabilities. And that'll provide grants to um, county human services agencies um, that, who would like to increase access to technology for older adults and adults with disabilities. Next slide. So for strategy C, opportunities to work. Um, recently, the California Department of Aging did have an opportunity to present the master plan for aging at the California Workforce Development Board and um, just discuss the inclusion of older adults in the workforce. And we do, we also received a $17 million enhanced federal funding um, investment over the course of three years to really improve employment opportunities for older adults in California. Next slide. Let's see, strategy E, protection from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Um, so as you know, um, we mentioned previously that CDA, along with Department of Social Services and Department of Justice, have been facilitating an interagency disability and elder justice work group, who's charged with essentially forming the California Disability or Elder and Disability Justice Coordinating Council. Um, we are right now in the process of reviewing 90 applications from stakeholder members who would like to be members on the committee. So our goal is to have about 15 state representatives and about 15 stakeholder representatives to serve on this um, larger coordinating council that we will convene um, with uh, the Department of Justice, the Attorney General. Um, so we're really excited about that. That enthusiasm, the 90 applications was really exciting for us. And then um, we also saw several investments such as a um, million dollars one time to help us actually um, develop the Elder Justice Coordinating Council and Adult Protective Services, APS, received um, $70 million general fund to expand their services. And that is housed at the Department of Social Services. And then for leadership in aging, um, you may have seen that CDA has really been advancing our um, no wrong door system. And so uh, we've been doing a lot of work and outreach to engage the public. We have hosted a kickoff convening and town halls for stakeholder engagement so that we can help strengthen and align those aging and disability hubs and spokes. Um, we have a website on CDA's page um, uh, where you can find the recordings from all of these um, convenings and town halls. Just recently on Tuesday, we hosted a town hall for Central Coast and the Bay Area. Um, next slide. And then also in the leadership on aging, um, since our last meeting, um, we did announce the impact committee and they did meet on July 14th. And so that impact committee is that advisory body who will help advise health and human services, as well as the cabinet work group on the implementation of the master plan for aging. And then we continue, of course, to improve um, our monitoring um, of master plan for aging's progress in partnership with the Department of Public Health, West Health Institute, and now UCLA has um, stepped up and is helping us with a lot of our um, data analysis and visualizations um, to um, really ensure that we are actually meeting those metrics and improving the lives of older adults in California. Um, next slide, thank you. So 
The Master Plan for Aging Local Playbook, we continue to engage with local communities. Um, recent workshops where we um, share the local playbook as well as the data dashboard for aging and highlighting all of those local uses um, that can be uh, found within the dashboard for aging. We've met with Orange County Disability Action Network, which is comprised of several Northern California counties, as well as the Inland Empire Long-Term Support Services Coalition and the California Parks and Recreation Society's aging section. Pretty soon we will be meeting up with um, Orange County again and Ventura County to host additional local playbook workshops. And so these are really a great way for CDA to connect with local leaders um, who are very interested in creating their own master plan for aging on that county or regional level. You know, it's not a secret that we really here at the MPA would love for every county to have their own master plan for aging. So we continue to work with the SCAN Foundation and other partners to build up this technical assistance that we can provide and build up the relationships that we have um, down on the ground within communities. And next slide, accountability. So just ensuring that the master plan is on track and achieving our goals. The cabinet work group continues to meet. Our next meeting is September 30th. We released that progress report in July. Please check that out. It's on um, a master plan for aging website. The impact stakeholder committee announced and we'll meet again in October. And then data dashboard for aging, we continue to update that. And then research work group. So we have been convening leaders from academic institutions across California to truly help us measure the impact of uh, the master plan for aging to identify the correct um, indicators that would really be meaningful. So um, we continue to build those partnerships and work on coordinating with UC Berkeley, West Health Institute and others to uh, create um, a strong plan of action for um, evaluation and um, outcomes measurement. Next slide. All right, I'm gonna hand it back to Maria. <laughs> let's, let's pause for one second. We promised we wouldn't do too much, but that was a lot. Any uh, questions, comments about kind of, or anything on your mind you wanna know about with master plan implementation or CDA implementation and equity? You can always put in the chat. We can come back to an open discussion, public comment, but uh, Denny. Thanks, Kim. Um, Amanda, really appreciated the overview. That was a lot of information, um, but glad to hear there's a lot of progress that's been made um, and work behind the scenes. I had a couple of questions. One was about, um, you had mentioned the sort of iPad distribution. I think there were several thousand that have been distributed. I'm curious if you all, how you all decided um, how to distribute them and if you've done any tracking now on the back end since they've been distributed, who got them um, and whether there's been sort of any analysis around demographics of the people who got them in terms of race and SOGI and um, rural versus urban. Um, so the first question is about the iPads um, and I don't know who makes the most sense to answer that. Yeah, no, you, you, I think you've been listening in on our staff meetings. Uh, so I'm going to uh, call on Michelle Davis um, from our Older Americans Act, or I, I think I saw Sutep, uh, yep. um, who's also our brand new, well, not brand new, you've been here a month now, Sutep, our Deputy Director of Home and Community Service Programs is here as well to give people an update on the distribution and the, the pre and post survey and data work that we are exploring how to make it nimble and meaningful. Absolutely. And thank you for the question. Sutep, please chime in if I've missed something. So um, thank you for the question. So the, um, the, it's been an exciting and a, quite a learning experience with regards to the tablets. And so what has happened so far is that we have distributed um, close to 4,000, 3,700 and some change um, iPads to our AAA network. And um, based on our uh, program guidance, we offered um, criteria in which the individuals the recipients would be eligible to um, take a three-tiered approach, readiness pre and post survey to make sure that they are technologically ready, um, met the criteria for our isolation. Um, that would be in the readiness survey. We, we um, work with our partners at USC to devise this. And then the, they we will de be deploying a pre-survey to make sure that we can measure the, the effectiveness of the tool. And then six months later, we'll be doing a post. So that's the analytical side. And so right, so you, the other question that you, I think you asked, I'll speak slower, sorry. Um, the other th question that I think you asked was about how did we decide? So we're, we 
how do we decide who received the, the tablets? And that we were relying on our um, area agency on agency agent area agency on aging providers to determine they know their community the best, and they are going to decide based on rural um, and the parameters in which we are um, have in the guidance who is going to be getting the distribution of the iPads. Does that answer your question? Did I leave anything out? Well, there's there was a sub piece of just about if you've done any analysis to figure out now that people have gotten them, or at least the 3,000 or so, um, you know, whether there's, you know, trends along race or language um, in terms of who's actually either going to get them or has gotten them to date. Absolutely. So thank you for that. And so I think we are in the beginning phases, which regards to the AAAs are getting ready to, to we are getting ready to support them and offering the, the surveys. So I think more information and more an analytics will come out in terms of your questions, which we would be happy to share. But at this point right now, we are looking at how to help and support our AAAs and making the survey um, portion as nimble and pliable so that we can get the data that you asked about. And Kim, I think you had another question for well, me. Well, I was just gonna say we can affirm that the data does involve some demographics to get it equity. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. And then just to bridge to that was the donated devices and the bought devices. Um, we just now were funded for another 17 million for more digital divide and counties through the Department of Aging, another 50 million. So this, what we're just been talking about was our round one, and we had a lot of learnings and we're really um, have more to do. There's a work group of AAAs working with CDA on it, but if there are other folks who'd like to help us figure out how to give out the next 17 million and 50 million to counties, uh, we welcome that. Oh, we would really, excellent point. And we would really welcome that, thank you. I also just wanted to take a moment, but to Darcy was kind enough to introduce herself in the chat, but Darcy Delgado is our, um, our uh, new to us Health and Human Services um, Assistant Secretary. So we're very delighted to have agency with us as well. Darcy, um, I know there is a lot happening with Secretary Galley's uh, commitment and leadership on equity. I don't know if there's um, an update that can be provided now or if we should just kind of tease that and say more to come on equity from the secretary. Hi, thanks so much, Kim. Nice to meet everyone. My name is Darcy Delgado, as Kim mentioned. I think I'm officially two weeks in uh, to my position as Assistant Secretary with uh, Health and Human Service Agency. And yes, I um, can say that equity is on the forefront of uh, many of CHHS's initiatives and that the secretary is extremely committed to equity specific in an aging population. So he pinged me this morning to make sure I was coming to this and make sure that I uh, represented our agency well and really here at this point, because I am so new, my apologies, to uh, try to soak up as much as possible, but also really appreciate everyone for their work in this arena and happy to assist when we can. Thanks, Kim. Any other um, questions? Did, did you have a second one, Danny, that we never even got to? Apologies. I mean, I don't want to hog up too much space. I have a lot of questions. I was just going to make one point and then one more question since you asked. Um, one is, I, I wonder, you know, I know why it makes sense to go through the AAAs on that first round, and I'm wondering if there's a way to broaden the partners that we're working with, I feel like some populations will get to AAAs more easily and others might, there might be more yeah, difficulty, they might be in other CBOs. Exactly what we're trying to sort through. Um, everything from robotic pets with ombuds uh, patients, uh, sorry, participants, excuse me, for long-term care ombuds to MSSP, smart speakers, and apologies for the acronyms, adult day health, um, tablets, uh, and even, um, because it's some flexibility, it could be a direct to senior centers or direct to other providers. So that's really the creative program design that's ahead of us. Of course, the clock is ticking and we wanna get the money and the devices out as quickly as possible. But yes, I think we welcome your design. Uh, we started with the AAAs, but we're happy to expand and experiment. That's great. Yeah, I know Rigo has a question, so I'll, I'll stop and let him get in here. 
Yeah, so I know we're, we, we got much ahead of us, Kim, but I just want to see if you could just expand a little bit about the training aspect, because I think that's such a great and important piece. And I'm so pleased that you have added that because, uh, there, you know, given when we think about equity, those who fall on the wrong side of the digital divide oftentimes is the skill piece that's really a missing component. So it's great to see that. And uh, so I want to, you can share a little bit more about that. Sure, and I'll do it exact same in the phase one, phase two. So in the first round, we really focused on kind of the bare bones IT support, tech support, help getting online, help getting um, connected um, through a contractor. Um, that's obviously very vital to have that kind of tech support. But with the new money, we are looking more broadly to see if there's, uh, there are people in the space who are experts at um, uh, helping older adults find the content and use the device that was meaningful to them. And so again, looking for some creative thought partners, potentially doing an RFP to see who could be that kind of uh, resource to our network of aging and disability, both funded through us and not, frankly, in helping older adults in California and disabled adults get and stay online. So uh, it, the good news is there's more people in the space than we realized. Uh, uh, we, want, we might want to, but we need to do some more sorting of the right partner for the, or partners with an S on the end uh, for that role. But yeah, 7 million in the budget to explore that. To do that, not explore it, to do it. <laughs> so we'll follow up with digital divide information, including the next work group, which again, I think has mostly been AAA, but we've been talking about broadening it. So we can follow up on that because uh, We've got some, some program expansion to, to do. Okay, I'm conscious of time and wanting to hand to Marcy. Marcy, it's our second time this week tag teaming. So I'll, this time I'll hand it to you. Oh, great, thank you. First, I just wanna uh, let you know that Kathleen Sullivan just contacted me and said she's never received the link to our uh, meeting today. So could someone please send that to her uh, yeah. ASAP? Thank yeah. you so much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to present a very, very brief history of uh, the collection of sexual orientation and gender identity data in California. And, and then I, I have a, a few questions I'm going to throw out to folks in a proposal. Uh, so let me start. Uh, Governor Brown signed AB 959, the LGBT disparate Disparities Reduction Act in 2015 uh, that requires four state agencies to collect voluntary self-reported demographic information on sexual orientation and gender identity in the regular course of collecting other types of demographic data. AB 959 also requires that the aggregated SOGI data be reported to the legislature and made publicly available. And now there were four agencies involved in, in AB 959, and that's the Department of Healthcare Services, Department of Public Health, Department of Social Services, and the CDA, the Department of Aging. Um, according to the Williams Institute, uh, California's overall population is made up of approximately 5.3% of people that self-identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender or queer questioning, LGBTQ. It is only in the last few decades with recent gains in LGBTQ civil rights that LGBTQ people have cautiously moved from fear that so SOGI data uh, collection would be used to discriminate against them to feeling safe enough to identify themselves. It's easy to understand how given the long history of discrimination, violence, and stigma and the rather short time frame of acquiring civil rights protection that many in the community continue to live a life of what I call strategic invisibility, passing uh, as, as straight or being out as gay. It was only 46 years ago, that's 1975, that California repealed the law which made consensual sex between same-sex adults a crime to give perspective, I was 29 years old that year. And same-sex marriage has only been legal in California since 2005. And that year I was 59 years old. This history of strategic invisibility has led the state to not have an accurate picture 
of how many Californians identify as LGBTQ. The actual percentage of LGBTQ Californians may be much higher than the 5.3% reported by the Williams Institute. From research and the SOGI data that has been collected, we know that LGBTQ people experience disparities in all aspects of their health. Both LGBTQ youth and older adults are at higher risk for substance use, cancers, cardiovascular disease, depression, anxiety, suicide, and HIV AIDS as compared to the general population. LGBTQ people are also generally known to receive poor quality of care due to stigma, provider insensitivity, and lack of awareness of the unique needs of the community. We know enough to know that SOGI data is more urgently needed now than ever before to effectively guide resources to reduce health disparities and, and increase access to care. Yet, according to Senator Wiener, Senator Scott Wiener, in a letter to the Joint Legislative Audit Committee uh, this past March, requesting an audit to examine the Department of Public Health, um, Senator Scott Wiener wrote, since the passage of AB 959, elected officials and advocates have had difficulty obtaining any relevant SOGI data. Senator Wiener's request for an audit was scheduled to be heard by the JLA committee this August, but due to a large number of requests, the JLA decided to delay the Senator's request. It is now on the calendar for January of next year. Yet another delay. Closer to home, the Master Plan on Aging has prioritized equity issues, bringing more focus to SOGI issues than ever before. The West Foundation is working hard to include SOCI data on our dashboard. The challenge is that out of more than 20 data sources, they have identified only two that include SOGI data. The BRFSS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, and the CHIS, California Health Interview Survey. The West team, when last contacted, is currently exploring these two data sets and will be making recommendations. What I would like to propose is that we elevate uh, SOGI, SOGI data collection on our dashboard uh, by posting the progress we have, the, the department has made and, 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 and by tracking continued progress as we go along. Um, I think by that way, by doing that, we can elevate this issue and, and keep it at the forefront of, 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 of our thoughts as we move forward through the master plan on aging. So I have some questions to throw out today for us to discuss. How can we ensure that SOGI data collection is integrated into the implementation of the master plan on aging? How can we track our progress? I would like to propose that, and that we share this pro process on SOGI with, also with the uh, triple three A's, uh, the triple three A's, uh, because we need to be sure that um, the triple A's are also um, uh, up to date on where the department is. Uh, with re respect to SOGI uh, data collection. So I'd like to open it up to a discussion on how we can best elevate um, SOGI data collection um, throughout the master plan. Uh, I think it's been great, the work that's being done on the dashboard, but it's not enough. Um, we have to really move this process forward. Does anybody like to ask a question or speak with any ideas of how we might do that? Marcy, I mainly want to reflect back and then I want to open. I think I heard you say two ideas. One was that the data dashboard for aging would be more express about 
um, our progress on on SOGI, like you know, two metrics have SOGI. Our goal is twenty. We're two twenty, so that even though the two are embedded, we're calling out our progress on our goal of full inclusion of SOGI. So that's yeah. very yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. So we'll, we'll take that to Terry in the in the West and the CDPH team. But and uh, but that may that's very thank you. That's very I, I love that idea. And then the the second is working with our AAAs on their SOGI data collection. And it just strikes me with the passage of the um, Senator Laird's HIV and Aging Act, the passage and signed by Governor Newsom, which is the prioritization of seniors uh, who are HIV positive and older Americans act. We will be issuing program guidance and that could be a good time to elevate yes. um, SOGI data. So I'm glad Sutep and Michelle are here and we can, so two reactions seem like yes. Uh, and then I want to hear more from the group about how to do those and then what else should be in the mix. Very Great. helpful. I think I saw Jack's hand up in, at one point in Julius. I just wanted to say uh, thank you, Ms. Edelman. Uh, as a gay black man who's living with HIV, I found that information very interesting. And, and I, uh, the AB 959, I guess, was passed without any kind of enforcement and uh, 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 mechanism with it either. So um, I think it's important for the follow up that you're describing to be done. Thank you. Thank you. And this is Julia, if I can hop in. in Hi, Julia. In terms of, of thinking about maybe other avenues to reach out to to gather data and information, um, perhaps the local law enforcement agencies, if they have had reports of, of other incidents coming in that they've had to track for their records or working closely with their local hospitals, that may be some sort of avenue to figure out other individuals who actually may need help or have experienced some sort of um, discrimination. I mean, it could be one avenue of, of you know, tying into police departments or um, fire departments, the first responders who have to take those reports. Um, possible, mm. just a thought. It's an interesting thought. Thank you, thank you. Kim, I have a question for you in terms of the department has guidelines, I assume, for asking these questions, asking SOGI questions. Am I correct? Uh, we collect the data. I think we shared a, a snapshot of it at our last meeting in June. And I'm gonna again call Michelle and Sutep back. Um, are, Cause I'm not sure if you're asking sort of. Um, well, I think the guy, guidelines in terms how, of how to ask the questions. Okay. Right. Because that's a big issue, and I wonder if, if I'm assuming we do have those guidelines, and could, and I would would prefer that they also be posted on, uh, on the dashboard in some way, so that it it's out there for people to see the guidelines that the department has set out for itself in terms of asking so deep questions. You know, I want to validate that assumption, actually, Marcy, because I've certainly seen best practice on on that, and including from San Francisco County and. Right. Uh, have shared them uh, in the context of my previous work around CalFresh. But I think that's a really great question to ask is if we're not just telling people you have to do something, but giving them the best practices for how you do something um, through a variety of channels. So I don't know, uh, Michelle or Sutep, if you could speak to what we've done in how to have these conversations. And um, I, I do remember from the previous meeting that we didn't have, a, we had low numbers of reporting which suggests that there's work to do in, in that kind of skillful data collection. Absolutely, Kim, and um, absolutely. And so I, 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 I think it would make absolute sense to look into having the guidelines and then the tool that the AAAs use to ask the questions for the registered services. Yes. I think that would absolutely make sense and be transparent to have those, uh, have that information on there for preliminarily um, for 2021. We collected close to 71,000 participant responses for our registered services. Um, 
So, it, and so I think being more transparent in how we collected that, or if there are barriers that our AAAs are facing in collecting that information, I think that we can look to a, a guideline or a best practice. Absolutely, great suggestion. Excellent. And the, we also want it for consistency uh, across, uh, across data collection. Um, it, uh, that's very important. Thank you. Well, any other questions? Well, this is a comment. Hi, Marcy, it's Edie. Um, Hi. I, I wonder in addition to helping agencies um, understand how to collect the data, in addition to posting the guidelines, maybe do a refresher of some kind of a training. And, and at this point, we're all virtual. So maybe it's a recorded session um, that can be posted um, to kind of walk people through that. Because I remember when the AAAs did that, that was enormously helpful to agencies to actually kind of talk through how to collect that data. And you think about turnover and staff that it, it might be a good idea to have that. Well, that's a really good uh, point, Edie, and thank you for bringing it up. I know that Open House in San Francisco, which is an LGBT older adult serving organization, uh, did trainings in, in, uh, in, I think in the Bay Area, and certainly uh, that I'm sure they could provide uh, a video. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent idea. Thank you, Marcy. Um, and if we I mean, I see one more. I see Vince's hand up before we thank you for keeping us on time, though. <laughs> um, hi, my um, comment is related. Um, I often get asked in San Francisco on how to do this. And what Marcia said, there is training that's needed, but a lot of times the training um, is charged for. And um, many of the agencies that want this training don't have money in their budgets to do that. So I think, you know, any way that that can be supported. Um, the other thing is that having best, guide, best practices is great, but my experience talking to people is it's the attitudes that people have. Like a lot of older people and people serving older people, at least that I've come across, think that it's none of their business to ask these questions. And so I don't know how you address that. But um, even though it's mandated and suggested by the state, I think there needs to be some thought put into how that is because um, there's still resistance. And this is in San Francisco Bay Area. So I can just imagine how it might be outside. And also I think special training needs to be done for transgender folks because that's changing consistently. And one of the hardest things to do um, is to make a referral for a transgender person um, where they may not be respected for their gender identity. And so anyway, I just want to put that out to the group. Hi, Vince. It's nice to see you again. Thank you for those. Yes, Marcy. Thank you. I was <laughs> yeah. so glad to see a familiar face. Oh, great to have you here. Uh, uh, the idea of having resources for the training. I know that the city of San Francisco funds open house for those trainings. And so perhaps the state could provide funding for those trainings as well for the triple A's. Yeah, I think this is all eminently doable in terms of this, this notion of here's where we are with data collection, here's the, the, the minimum, the expectation, the compliance, here's written guidelines, here's some recorded training. Uh, we absolutely have funding that would pay for that kind of uh, expert support, particularly this year, I can't say that every year, but given the support of the legislature and the governor and the federal administration for Build Back Better, this is exactly what equity dollars are for. Um, and I appreciate the attention to um, skills and attitudes to the entire queer gender spectrum. Um, those are points well taken. Uh, and so I think we can charge our team, Michelle and Sutep and Amanda are here to, and, and I should say Carmen Gibbs, part of our internal uh, uh, racial equity team to take back a plan of action that program can execute with many of these ideas and continue to work on. Um, this is a core mission for us and we can, we can and will do better. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Marcy, so much. Um, looking forward to continued conversation about that. Feel free to send emails or questions to me and I can pass them to Marcy or reach out directly to her. Now we're gonna uh, welcome Dr. Kathleen Sullivan with the Open House in San Francisco. Hi, Kathleen. 
for our LGBTQ and aging policy and discussion. Welcome. Hi. I'm just texting my staff, telling them I'm going to be late to my next meeting. Um, well, it's it's great to be here, and I actually do see some familiar faces. Um, Danny and Kevin in particular um, from Justice and Aging. So great to see you. And then of course, Marcy, who uh, is an icon in many different fields, but certainly for those of us who work in LGBTQ aging issues. Um, you know, I, I do wanna thank um, uh, the California Commission on Aging um, for signing on to the amicus brief that Justice and Aging um, and Open House and Sage and a few other groups have worked on and really Justice and Aging gets most of the credit. I will give it to them. And so if Denny or Kevin would like to chime in, please do. You know, I think that um, I just came from Oregon and we always look to California as being um, really, you know, years ahead of us in terms of policy. Um, and I'll just give you a very quick example um, because it's something that just wrapped up and was just presented on in Oregon um, this past Tuesday. It took us three years to get the state to actually agree to do any type of data collection, um, not as you are talking about, but actually to help fund um, a research project on LGBTQ aging because we have uh, we are very far from even having triple A's in the state of Oregon agree to collect data on sexual orientation and gender identity. So I think there's always a lot of work to be done. Um, and I truly appreciate the work that this group and others and probably others who came before have done in terms of creating inclusive, safe environments for LGBTQ older Californians. Um, and I, I, you know, uh, have worked on policy issues. I was in California for a while and worked specifically on um, uh, ensuring that LGBTQ older service members were linked to their benefits. Um, and that was funded um, by the Smith Memorial Trust and then um, the Unit Health Foundation. And we did some policy work in Sacramento. Um, but I feel that, you know, Open House is not the lead organization when you think of policy issues, although perhaps we'll be taking more of a stance. I wanted to um, talk a little bit, and I'm happy to answer questions, but then also, um, unless I'm wrong, I think the thing I was asked to really mention or speak about is a little bit on the court case um, that the Third Circuit Court um, of appeals uh, ruled on, I think it was the day after I started at Open House in July. And um, this ruling was, as I'm sure all of you know, allowing for the intentional misgendering or dead naming of transgender elders who were living in long-term care settings, um, nursing homes, assisted living communities. And I just, you know, when I do trainings for people and Open House does do training, so um, please feel free to connect with me and I can put my contact information in the chat um, about those trainings. Um, we certainly would be very happy to work with you all in the AAAs to ensure that the way the questions are being answered, or excuse me, asked, and Vince, I think you mentioned um, the attitude that people are having when they're asking those questions, um, as well as towards the responses they get, you know, we just want to make sure that providers are trained in the best possible way, because um, oftentimes, we know from the research of um, Dr. Karen Fredrickson Goldson, um, who's really the preeminent researcher on LGBTQ aging nationally, that when some an elder discloses their sexual orientation or gender identity and they're met with either a neutral or a negative response, that has a negative impact on that elder. And um, we go around and we actually train people and it's very simple training, you know, asking people to thank the elder for sharing that information. And is there more that they would like to share or that they feel um, the provider needs to know? And so we're um, right now actually working on a short video with some of our community members that will really reveal what it feels like 
to not be respected um, by a provider and what impact that has on care. Um, because I think that's what you know our community members want. I think that's what everybody on this Zoom, I was gonna say call, but we're actually not on a call on a Zoom, whatever we call these things. Um, really want. We want to be respected. We want to feel safe. And we want to make sure that we have competent care that's uh, sensitive to the needs that we have as individuals. Um, and when I do do trainings with providers, I talk a lot about intention versus impact. And this ruling by the Supreme Court was really, um, not, even, not the Supreme Court, excuse me, by the Third Circuit Court, um, was really ignoring this basic premise of um, of really the foundation of being a competent provider, that we wanna ensure that the impact of our words is not gonna be negative on the people that we're providing care for. And, um, you know, I just thought I would take um, just a quick second to note two things that Eric Carlson, who's um, from Justice and Aging and, and wrote the amicus um, um, letter that we are part of, as well as others, um, pointed out that you know, the, the decision was wrong because it misinterpreted the law. Um, the law that protected um, transgender elders in long-term care settings um, did not stipulate that someone who made a mistake, um, and even if you made that mistake more than once in misgendering someone, that you would ever be uh, liable or that staff person would ever be liable for criminal um, prosecution. Um, that's not at all what the um, what the law uh, explicitly states. Um, so accidental misgendering is non-punishable, and that that was really the pivotal um, difference in terms of a legal standard. But Eric did a great job, um, I think, in going beyond that and really talking about what we as providers talk about that there's really a danger to the health and the well-being of um, all Californians if their provider is knowingly and repeatedly disrespecting them. And in this instance, it is about um, LGBTQ older adults. And so, you know, the Yale uh, Journal of Law and Feminism actually had a really great um, story recently that they um, published about a transgender man who uh, was purposely misgendered, had decided not to come out as transgender to residents of the nursing home where he was, um, but as a transgender man, he um, could not hide his, um, his gender from the people that were providing his care. So the people who were helping to wash him, clothe him, and he started to refuse all care as he was being not just misgendered, but also put in clothes that were inappropriate for his gender. So he was being dressed in dresses and skirts and being called by his, um, what we call his dead name. So his former name um, that he had given up. And this elder uh, stopped eating, stopped um, accepting care and um, was determined um, by um, the medical staff of that facility um, to have a failure to thrive and um, was, subsequently um, ordered to have a guardian who would actually be the person in charge of their care. And fortunately for this person, um, this transgender elder, they actually had um, someone who was very supportive of them who was named as their guardian. But I just, I think I wanna um, just emphasize to all of you that transgender elders in particular are the most harassed, the most abused, um, members of our society and um, that over 40% have suicidal ideation um, in any given year. And indeed, if you look at all lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender elders who were surveyed uh, two years ago by the American Association of Retired People, AARP, 72% um, do not feel comfortable revealing their sexual orientation or gender identity to providers. And for someone who's worked in this field for a long time, when I hear something like that, all of my alarm bells goes off, go off because we know that this group of seniors are more likely to live alone. We know from the great work of Dr. Carla Parasonato, 
that living alone for older adults correlates with isolation and isolation now we know correlates um, very highly with um, uh, with death and with an earlier death. And so when we hear these things, you know, we think of our community members that we work with and the trust that we have to build um, with our community members. And I know it's difficult for sort of mainstream providers of care and services, but I also know that we're doing a really great job, but we need to keep going down the path. And I know that Dr. Edelman was talking about getting more data. That's certainly one way to do it. Um, but I also think that, you know, you all as um, being on this commission are able to really amplify the voices and the stories of people who are um, unfortunately targeted oftentimes for discrimination and for outright harassment. Um, you know, if you are interested in learning more about this topic and the impacts of this, both Eric and myself, as well as one of our community members, um, will be on uh, will be on the Commonwealth Club um, on October fourteenth, and we're going to be specifically discussing the impact of this type of language on transgender elders in um, long term care communities. And we'll have um, elders with us who can share their experiences. And that's really great. We're very happy for that. But what we also need is for all of you to help us tell those stories and to really um, amplify the message that this isn't just in inarticulate speech. This is actually harmful and it's hurtful speech that puts a barrier up between an elder California native or California you know, newbie like me to actually getting care. Um, and that can be incredibly detrimental for someone's mental health um, or physical health. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know if I reached what you all were interested in me talking about today. I hope that I was able to answer some questions um, or illuminate. But if people have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them either about um, this particular topic or about my organization or certainly about any of the trainings that, um, that my organization offers. Let's open that up for questions and comments. So appreciate that um, that bracing update. Joseph and Aging, do you want to add anything? You were referenced and credited many times. <laughs> um, I thought Kathleen did a great job. This is Danny from Justice Thinking. I thought Kathleen did a great job summarizing sort of um, both the, the legal reasoning, why we think the legal reasoning in the decision was flawed, as well as some of the policy harms with the um, circuit, the Court of Appeals decision. Um, a big kudos to our uh, my colleague, Eric, who um, took really the bulk of the work in terms of drafting. Um, I just want to make sure people understood sort of the procedural history or the procedural next steps. So this was a letter in support of the California State Attorney General's um, petition to the California Supreme Court to seek review in this case. Um, so essentially the Court of Appeal has come out at the state court level um, invalidating this decision or invalidating this provision of the long-term care, um, LGBT long-term care Bill of Rights um, provision. And so this letter is seeking support or is supporting the state's um, petition for review. So we're asking the California Supreme Court to review it and hopefully reverse the lower court. Other discussion, comments? Uh, Denny, I had a question or perhaps it's for Kathleen. Um, the long-term the long care ombuds been involved in this? We'd like to help make that connection. Um, as a voice for long-term care residents as well. So happy to assist with that if they're not yet tied in. That's a really great question. You know, I don't know the answer to it. Um, they're not on um, on this brief. I know Equality California and um, NCLR have also submitted a letter um, in support of the AG, but uh, I don't know if the ombudsman okay. has, but that would be great. That would be a great connection that I'd really appreciate. Thank you, Kim. Yep, for sure. And Derek. Oh, hi, uh, Kathleen and Marcy. Uh, thank you so much for the information you just shared. Uh, I just want to 
say kudos to both of you because uh, I've known Open Health for quite some time, and I was still uh, back in the days at the San Francisco Department of Aging and Adult Services. So again, thank you for continuing to be a strong advocate and uh, keep it a good work. Thank you. I mean, I think we're getting close to our, uh, our, our bio break for all of us to so take a moment, but I do want to just flash on the written Q&A that have come in. Um, we've got some, um, Mariella's uh, making connections with what's happening in LA. Lots of LA folks here, LA County Commission on HIV um, for follow-up and connection. And does the AAA collect data on non-English speakers? Um, uh, my memory is yes, that is one of the, there's about two pages of demographic uh, information, but we can confirm unless anybody else here knows their uh, AAA uh, data uh, indicators off the top of their head. Derek, I'm looking at you. Uh, but I believe that that's right, language is in there. And we are actually working to do more to, to diversify. We can talk about that at a future meeting. Anything else before the break or Amanda, from either the, the uh, committee itself or Amanda in terms of keeping us on track? Okay, well, uh, this has been a tremendously in informative discussion for us. I appreciate all the advice and direction and connections. We've got our action items. Um, and with that, I think we will take a break, come back in about five, uh, let's see. We need at least five minutes to <laughs> take a break. So I encourage you to turn off your, um, at least your audio and your camera so you can uh, take a break and we'll be back at um, about 3.12. Let's give you a whole six minutes according to my clock and we'll talk about vaccines. See you on the other side.
Okay, as we start to come back, I have at least one clock in my room saying 312. Somehow my view has changed. Let's see, I wanna see as many people as possible. There you all are. Well, we are gonna to turn to a, a topic that remains uh, top of mind, has been now for almost 10 months uh, as the vaccine has come into um, availability here in our country and um, available to older adults and adults with disabilities and their caregivers and family. I wanna welcome Dr. Karen Mark from the Department of Healthcare Services. Karen and I had the chance to work together in particular on expanding access to transportation to vaccines. So I am very glad to be uh, hear her again. I saw her for a second and then I lost her. Dr. Mark, are you still with us? <laughs> Terrific. Oh. There we go. Hi, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Karen Mark. I'm the medical director at the Department of Healthcare Services. So. Um, do I, I think someone else is running my slides. Is that correct? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, there we go. Um, and if you want to just go to the next slide. Um, and, you know, to the next one is fine. So this is really, um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time sharing some data that we have on COVID vaccination rates, both in the state as a whole and in Medi-Cal in particular. Um, and really, we're sharing these data quite widely because we recognize that there are unfortunately large disparities in who's getting vaccinated in the state, um, you know, both by payer source, Medi-Cal versus non-Medi-Cal, as well as, um, you know, by race, ethnicity, by uh, age, et cetera. Um, so I, um, we're, we're really sharing these da data as widely as possible to, to get folks input on how we can improve vaccination rates throughout the state. So um, this slide shows the percentage of Californians on the left and Medi-Cal beneficiaries on the right who've received at least one dose of COVID vaccination um, as of September 5th. Um, and this is among people who are 12 years of age and older, which of course is the population that's eligible for vaccination. And you know what really sticks out, and we've been following this data every two weeks, we post it on our website every two weeks, you know, vaccination rates are, are improving um, throughout the state, um, but we see this large disparity in terms of Medi-Cal beneficiaries um, really across all counties in the state uh, being less likely to be vaccinated than, than Californians as a whole. Next slide. Um, and this um, just looks at um, all of our counties um, and, and just summarizes what's on the previous map. So if we look statewide, 76% of all Californians 12 plus have been vaccinated or had received at least the first dose of the COVID vaccine, but only 52% of Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And this, this difference varies by a, a bit by county, but it's really present in all counties. Um, so if you go to the next slide and then the next one, Great. Um, then here we see, see um, the percent who've received at least one dose um, comparing Medi-Cal beneficiaries in the lighter blue with statewide in the darker blue um, by age. And um, we see, you know, a, a disparity among all age groups. Um, you know, among the older Californians, 65 plus, the disparity is actually less, but it's still considerable. Um, and then we see um, disparities, you know, among both the teenagers um, as well as the other age groups. Next slide. Um, and this similar, similarly shows um, the disparities that we see uh, between Medi-Cal beneficiaries and statewide rates um, by race ethnicity. Um, so we, here we see um, among Medi-Cal beneficiaries in the light blue and statewide in the darker blue um, disparities across, across all race ethnicities, some wider among some groups than others. And then go ahead to the next slide. Then we're also looking in Medi-Cal um, at the um, percent of our beneficiaries um, who have received at least one dose by Medi-Cal managed care plan. Um, 
And uh, this is posted on our website as well. And this is, you know, partially a function, obviously, of where where the beneficiaries are that each Medi-Cal plan serves. As we see across the state, there are certainly um, some areas of the state where there's been much higher vaccine uptake than elsewhere. Um, but our goal, obviously, is vaccine uptake everywhere. Next slide. Um, then I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the vaccine equity metric that CDPH has um, has shared a, a lot about. And this is uh, looking at the Healthy Places Index, which reflects um, 25 community characteristics using, using data related to the economy and education, healthcare access, sort of neighborhood characteristics, et cetera. And what CDPH has done is divided these um, zip codes into four quartiles um, based on the Healthy Places Index. And those with the highest Healthy Places Index scores um, correlate to better health outcomes, while those at the lowest scores or the first quartile reflect uh, worse health outcomes. And in general, higher HPI scores also correlate with higher household incomes and lower HPI scores correlate with lower household incomes. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is where we looked at COVID-19 vaccination um, status um, among all Californians, again, on the left, and then Medi-Cal beneficiaries on the right. And we've looked at this by Healthy Places Index quartile. Um, so on the left, for example, if we look at um, you know, all Californians, uh, we see that vaccination right, rates um, are higher in the um, the quartiles, the higher quartiles and lower in the lowest healthy places index quartile. And one of the things that CDPH is putting a huge amount of emphasis now on is making sure that we're really reaching um, everyone in, in these lower quartiles as well. Um, but then we can also look among Medi-Cal beneficiaries on the right. And you know, because we serve a lower income population, we expect to have a higher population in, in um, quartile one. Uh, in, in, in a lower population, for example, in quartile four. Um, but again, we see um, disparities in, you know, in the percentage uh, within each quartile who, who are vaccinated. And, you know, for example, the only 40% of folks in quartile one on Medi-Cal um, have received at least one dose as compared with 58% among all Californians. Um, next slide. Um, so uh, one of the things that we've been doing to try and um, improve vaccination rates um, among all of our beneficiaries um, has been to launch our Medi-Cal Vaccine Incentive Program. Um, and this is a, a, an incentive program for managed care plans to increase COVID vaccination. There's three components of the program. Um, the first is a vaccine response plan. So our Medi-Cal managed care plans have the option of turning in a vaccine response plan to us by September 1st, we would all come in to us, um, and they received a, a payment of $50 million was um, dedicated to plans um, for putting together that plan. And that plan is really a plan for them to work very closely with their community-based organizations, with their um, local uh, public health uh, folks, et cetera, to um, really try and get vaccines out into the community. Um, so not just among their providers, but, but everywhere in the community. Um, plan also puts, uh, puts aside 100 million for direct member incentives. So basically gift cards of up to $50 for members um, after vaccination. This is designed to um, help folks with you know, some of the things that, that challenge people about getting vaccination, right? If you get, take time off work and you don't get work and you don't get paid, um, then you might be less motivated to get vaccination. But if you, um, you know, are able to get a gift card, that might help make up for not getting paid while you take time off. Um, and then finally, um, 200 million for vaccine outcome achievement. Um, so basically these are payments to the managed care plans tied to three intermediate outcomes and seven vaccine uptake outcome measures on the next slide. Um, and it, yeah, thank you. Um, so these measures um, include um, a, the percent of homebound Medi-Cal um, beneficiaries who receive at least one dose of a COVID vaccine, 
percent of Medi-Cal beneficiaries 50 to 64 with one or more chronic diseases who received at least one dose of a vaccine, um, and the percent of primary care providers in the managed care plans network providing vaccine in their office. And this is because we've realized, you know, for some people, their managed care or their their primary provider is really a trusted source of information, and the more primary providers have vaccines in their office. Uh, the more the more uh, people will be willing to get vaccinated. Um, and then we also have um, these next um, measures that really are just measuring vaccine uptake. So the percentage of Medi-Cal beneficiaries 12 years of age and older who received at least one dose. Um, and then we um, uh, have uh, measures related to um, the age strata, 12 to 25, 26 to 49, 50 to 60 four and 65 plus. Um, and then we also have um, separate outcome measures related to the percent of beneficiaries 12 and older from the race or ethnic group with the lowest baseline vaccination rate who received at least one dose. Um, so what we're trying to do is um, uh, improve vaccination rate in each of these populations. And um, the goal is to close the gap um, the rates in the population as a whole and the rates in Medi-Cal so, um, so that we have equal and higher vaccination um, among all these populations. So with that, I think I'll just pause. Oh, and then um, thank you. Um, we're also really strengthening our efforts um, working with managed care plans, as I just mentioned, but also with local public health departments, with CDPH, with um, providers, agencies, and various stakeholders serving our homebound populations, um, as well as all of our healthcare systems and community-based uh, organizations to improve vaccination rates. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, we are posting this data on our website every two weeks um, so that we can see what kind of progress we're making. So with that, I think I will um, pause. I, um, yeah, this is just a little bit about our um, uh, the data, where the data come from, um, and, and open it up to questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Any uh, clarifying questions? I think watching the time, I can have my CDA team give a very quick update on um, uh, what we're doing um, so that we get to the questions, which are supposed to be uh, very soon. Um, but before we do that, I know, Dr. Mark, your time is very um, precious as well. So any questions for DHCS? Uh, certainly that Medicaid focus is one important part of an equity strategy. So thank you for um, highlighting that. If we were going to save, sorry, this is Danny. If we're going to save our questions for after the CDA update, um, Dr. Mark, will you still be on in case we have DHCS specific questions? I can stay on. I think that's... Uh... Until four, is that correct? Yeah, you can even be here for a few more minutes. That would be great. I really appreciate yeah, it. I can stay okay. here. Thanks. Then I'm going to ask my CD, uh, uh, CDA team. I do want us to share a lot of the work that's happening to focus on these intersections with age um, and race, age and um, poverty uh, to get the vaccine out. But I also want to hear from you all. So Connie, can um, we've got a, a, a many slides. Maybe we can do the 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 short version. Um, and then Michelle, can you put an, up, an update in the chat about the vaccine incentive guidance that's coming out on the Older Americans Act programs as well? I that sure will. Go Connie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a, a real quick snapshot. This is a slide that was from the uh, vaccine advisory um, uh, committee. Um, uh, that focused on uh, folks that had, you know, first initial dose um, and you can see there's a wide range of it. It splits it up by uh, race. Um, and you'll see the disparities are the lower ones tend to be, you know, it's Latino, Black, multiracial, um, American Indian, Alaskan Native, and also Asian. Next slide. To sum it up, 82% um, of the population, uh, 65 and older, um, received one dose. 72% are fully vaccinated. Um, adult 65 plus make up 72% of all COVID deaths in California, and almost 70% of all those deaths are from communities of color. So you can definitely see the disparities in that is it's age and also minority groups as well. Um, we have some federal funding um, to CDA, the AAAs, and also the ADRCs for older adult vaccine outreach. Um, so we just outlined the amounts. Next slide. There's three main strategies right there. <laughs> three main strategies that we're utilizing to uh, promote uh, vaccine outreach. Um, first is 
ethnic media, really utilizing uh, the ethnic media channels as the voice of the communities, um, since a lot of those communities really rely on getting their information from ethnic media sources and they're seen as a trusted messengers. So we have been doing uh, statewide press briefings um, using more of that earned media. So we had four press brief briefings planned. Uh, we've done uh, two of the four so far um, and we have two more to go. We're also leading on paid ethnic media advertisements as well. Next slide. Another strategy we're using is utilizing actual broadcast radio and television um, to reach those older adults and also utilizing some more um, uh, the um, outlets that typically older adults access because some of them may not have access technology or aren't technology savvy. So direct mail is still one um, uh, highly utilized by adult 65 plus and we still have some online uh, to supplement it as well. Um, and, and on this slide, there's actually links to um, different sample spots that you'll see. There's radio and TV spots, and also you see an image of the direct mail piece that we've used. Next slide. The third strategy uh, that we're using is grants to both the AAAs and ADRCs for targeted outreach. Um, so some of them have opted to do their own local outreach, and we're helping support uh, whatever information that they have. So we have uh, uh, information on zip codes that we've helped prioritize, um, and that's also based on using the CDPH data based on the population uh, that is vaccinated, and we've matched that against the percentage of 65 plus population in the zip code, and we come up with an indexing on the way those counties and zip codes are sorted. So we've given them that as information for guidance, and that those also help guide us in terms of how we target the media that we use. Next slide. I mean, just to sum it up, um, all the information that I presented here, um, and there's also additional resources if you want to check out the zip codes and, and really look through some of the other ads and creative that we're using, um, you can go on our website and you'd be able to access it. Um, so on our homepage, you can either access it through the COVID information resources button or under our highlights, and we have a specific page dedicated towards our vaccine outreach campaign. Good job, Connie. <laughs> and now let's turn to, uh, before we go to full open forum, if there's questions and comments on um, vaccines and efforts to uh, close the equity gaps. Derek. I just want to say the uh, media campaign has been quite successful. Uh, at least for the uh, commercials I've watched in both Cantonese and uh, Mandarin, which are the two main dialects uh, uh, from you know China, I think those are uh, you know sending the right information. Also, the great use of uh, the physicians to disseminate information and to also dispel any myths. Uh, very uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Danny. Great. Um, thank you to both of you for really informative uh, presentations. Uh, vaccine equity is near and dear to my heart. And I had um, just a question, a follow-up question for Dr. Mark and also a follow-up question for Connie. Um, Dr. Mark, I you know, was a little bit heartened, I guess, to see that the disparity for older adults, older Californians um, on Medicaid versus not on Medicaid is at least a little bit lower than some other populations, which um, hopefully is a good thing. Um, but I was curious, you know, in thinking about the health plan strategy and um, the incentives for Medi-Cal plans. If you all are working, doing any of the same kind of work with CalMedi Connect plans, I was just thinking about it because, you know, in our universe, um, we're thinking really about older Californians. And while it's true that um, a lot of them are, you know, Medi-Cal plan members, many of them are thinking about targeting, like by definition, if you're in CalMedi Connect, you're going to be older and or a person with disability because of the Medicare status. So, um, I was just wondering if any of that targeting is happening with CalMedi Connect, because I think that would be a really great way to bridge specifically the older adult gap that we still continue to see. Um, and then I'll save my question for Connie after Dr. Mark has a chance to, to respond. Thank you so much for that question. So yeah, I should have made it clear, but, but um, CalMedi Connect plans can also participate in this vaccine incentive program. So obviously they're focusing their um, outreach and their um, efforts on the, the beneficiaries that they serve. So yes, they are also included in the program. And, and do you have a sense of what the uptake is for the CalMedi Connect plans? Are there many that are participating? 
I believe they are, they are. I know that the overall uptake was very high. I don't have the number in front of me, um, but but my understanding is it was very high. And I can certainly get back to you if you want the, the number of the new recipients. Great, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to sort of do the overlay also with the county analysis, because of course there are disparities in depending, you know, depending on the county level. Um, Tanya, my question for you, you know, I've seen the infamous slide from that one CVAC meeting um, that laid out all the different, you know, racial groups and then the age breakdowns of vaccination rates. And I feel like that was, now it's, it's been a while since that slide was first created. And I'm wondering, you know, my attempts to get more updated data have not been necessarily fruitful. And I'm wondering if um, you all, or, you know, in conjunction with CDPH have more updated data since that snapshot back in May. I don't have an updated uh, snapshot of that slide specifically on how that's broken down, um, but what we've been able to utilize is the data that's available on the dashboard, which tells us how many cases and how many deaths. So that's when we pulled the percentages of, um, you know, we can see it was uh, what 73% deaths for 65 and older, and then we can see the different uh, ethnicities parsed out as well, and that came up to, um, was it 75 was the number 75% was a people of color. But I guess we still, like, we don't have, other than that one snapshot in May, we don't have updated vaccination um, metrics broken down by race and age. So for, right? for, yeah, for vaccination metrics specifically, we don't have it broken down the way they had that one broken down. We can take that back and see if we can ask CDPH, especially given the push since that time, if there's a update on that. Um, we can maybe work with you, a track back where that came from, but yes, we can try to pull that thread. That would be helpful. That would be great. Thanks, Kim. Hey, Kim, I just wanted to add, this is Rigo. Um, I, just a quick uh, question also within a further breakdown of within the racial ethnic groups, US born versus immigrant populations. Do we have any particular data around that, because I'd be interested to know, like when we're looking at particularly, let's say Latino populations, you know, how, how is that being teased out and which ones are being vaccinated at a higher rate versus lower rate and, and guess perhaps, you know, being limited English proficient and an immigrant would have an impact. So I'd be curious about that data as well as possible. We'll put it on the list. Denny, do you remember from the CVAC work if that, breakout was there, U.S. born versus not U.S. Okay, but that's a great point, Rigo. Kim, can I can I jump in here with my question? This is Bettenice. Yes, please. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I think we just, we still just, in doing the work, right, we, we still continue to see just a major need for in-language materials, right, FAQs, like, um, that is, there's a huge need for that. So I think it's super important, the point that Denny made on just the data, right? We just, we need the data so that we can make sure that those materials are available and appropriate uh, for the communities that we're trying to serve. Uh, in addition, you know, we all know that the folks that haven't got vaccinated, the folks that we're still trying to reach, it's the heaviest of lifts. And so I hope that, you know, we are taking the funding into consideration, right? Because now it's taking us like a 20 minute conversation or five calls to the same person to try to get them, um, you know, the information that they need or to convince them to get vaccinated. And so I think that when the funding was coming out initially, it was like based on a, a, a individual kind of touch point and reach, and that is absolutely no longer the case. So I just want to provide that uh, for insight. We've certainly heard that on the ethnic media briefings when we have community outreach um, experts present on their experience. The the number of the, the number of contacts, the the um, uh, the length of them, and the personal sharing, the connection, the, the the richness of the contacts are all part of what's successful, and that doesn't come quick. <laughs> right. Rigo, I wanna be cautious of um, the time for opening up, although I hate to leave the vaccine issue. Um, I defer to you, hand you the mic. 
Well, thank you, Kim. So uh, as we customarily do, we try to have, a, you know, uh, devote a session to uh, open uh, time for our members to provide feedback. Uh, particularly, there are a number of our members who sit on other committees, statewide committees that intersect with our equity work. And so this is a great time for them to update us on uh, any particular issues um, that uh, we should be aware about uh, and or require any feedback from us. Uh, there's, we also want to uh, hear from you on any particular updates from members, any key updates. And we have uh, one or two today uh, that we definitely want to share uh, and perhaps um, more. And, um, and, uh, and lastly, we want to get some ideas perhaps for thinking about agenda items for future meetings. So uh, today has been amazing. It's been a you know, wonderful presentations, really on point uh, issues that uh, we all really deeply care about. So we want to see more of that uh, in, in the upcoming meetings as well. So with that, I'd like to open it up for uh, members, starting with the members who sit on other uh, committees, uh, like the Alzheimer's Advisory Committee, Long-Term Care Insurance Task Force, et cetera. If you could uh, chime in and share with us any particular updates that you may have. Um, and so I'm going to, it looks like um, there's a hand raised. Kiara, you have a... Uh, um, you want to share? Uh, you're on mute, Kiara. Yeah. Thank you for telling me that. Hi, everybody. I'm Kiara Harris. Many Thank of you, you. Hey, how's everybody doing? It's been a while since I've been here. I was out of the country for a few months. I'm happy to be back. There's a lot of good things going on, both with what's happening with the with, with this organization as well as my own nonprofit. And I wanna take the time to let you guys know that we are having an event. I put it in the notes where we are going to be providing what we're calling Sankofa stories. And this is stories about um, black people in, um, in, in Los Angeles talking about their concerns and issues related to aging. And we think it ties closely into what we've been trying to do on this platform, and I left it in the uh, yeah. in the in the in the notes for everyone to please check it out. And I want to invite everyone to attend. And if you have any questions, I left uh, a phone number for my colleague in that information. So that is going to be on September 30th of this month, and would like to have everyone join us if you are able to. Is it virtual? It is it is not virtual, but you can oh. you can you can join virtually. We will be live in, in LA, but you can join virtually. Yeah. And we would okay. love to have you be there. We've got some new information and I think it is very relevant to the work we've been doing here at the Master Plan for Aging, particularly for the African American community. So I hope to see you all there. I will be there if I get a link. Okay, I'm gonna get you a link right now. I'm gonna text Carlene and tell her to text me right now. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Kiara. Anyone else like to share, particularly members of the committee, any reports? Uh, Derek, you have your hand up? Uh, thank you, Rico. I am part of the Alzheimer's Advisory Committee. And so we uh, met last week and we uh, had an update on the Alzheimer's investments in the 2021-22 Budget Act, and also updates from the California Department of Public Health. Uh, we also spent some time looking at the cross-cutting Alzheimer's and related disorders issues and prioritization. And then the Alzheimer's Association provided us with a legislative update. Um, and also we uh, look at the final recommendations and items uh, or updates to the secretary. So it's a very great uh, discussion. And uh, so we meet uh, every quarter and I will provide uh, additional updates after the next meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Derek. Um, let's see, um, Leandra, would you, are you on? Would you like to give an update on the committee you've been working on? Hi, this is Leandra, can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry, I've been um, traveling today, so I'm actually like in and out of the airport, but it's been good to listen in. No update at this time. 
Um, but it's been good to hear everybody else's um, updates and hopefully I'll have more to share with you next time. All right, thank you, Leandra. Safe travels. I can't. Well, maybe, maybe I can. Uh, Leandra has been instrumental. She's being too modest uh, in uh, working as a member of the Behavioral <laughs> Health Task Force uh, mm -hmm. to um, uh, get older adults on the agenda for an upcoming um, Behavioral Health Task Force that's being run by Secretary Mark Galley. So uh, we are working to, with Leandra as a member of that task force to help present on older adults and behavioral health. So stay tuned, still a work in progress, but Leandra just wanted to shine a light on your work for just a second. It's really um, been instrumental to have your leadership and expertise. I appreciate that. And I wasn't sure if things were um, shaped up enough and ready to give a report. So I was holding on that, but thank you. <laughs> it's thank gonna you. happen, it's gonna happen. We're gonna okay. make it happen. <laughs> Sounds good. There's my report, appreciate the team. <laughs> Well, stay tuned for more of the next meeting then. Um, anyone from the uh, Disability and Aging Community Living Advisory Committee or Elder Justice Coordinating Council? Okay. Well, I do have to report the, um, the, the, the uh, I'm only saying it sarcastically, the, the, uh, the bad news that the Disability and Aging Community Living Advisory Committee is losing its co-chair, uh, Claire Ramsey from Justice and Aging. Uh, because she has decided to join the administration and come into the Department of Social Services and run the brand new Disability, Aging, and Housing Division. How about that? So we can't be too sad. <laughs> but stay tuned. We will be recruiting a new uh, stakeholder co-chair to join Eric Harris from Disability Rights California in co-chairing um, this very important stakeholder uh, advisory committee, which will be meeting this their next meeting will be focused on, I believe, housing. Um, so I think we'll see Claire there still, but on the other side of the other side of the round table, if you will. A little bit of sweet, but we're really thrilled to have Claire move into that position. Thank you, Kim. And did you have anything from the long-term care insurance task force you'd like to mention? Um, yes. What is the short update? Uh, <laughs> there is a lot of information posted on the Commissioner Lara's homepage on the long-term insurance. Uh, we have a seat on there, as well as uh, Anastasia Dodson representing Department of Healthcare Services. They have engaged a consultant who is really putting us through a rigorous process to uh, do our homework and to respond to surveys and really try to dig deep into how we pay for long-term care insurance and frankly, how it intersects with Medicaid. Um, and make sure that there's an equitable um, solution for the long-term care. We often, that issue is often framed as solving um, an issue of the missing middle. And of course we wanna do that, but wanna make sure we have the equity lens. So the next meeting, Anastasia is really working hard, Anastasia Dodson to co-create with the insurance task force, how we um, make those connections in a very complex policy area. And I'll remind you, there's AARP stakeholders on there as well, Nina um, uh, Burwell Harwell, and I'm, I'm not gonna be able to rattle off all of them, but yes, they're meeting bi-monthly now and um, we are working very hard. We, we shared with, I oh, I can tell you one last thing. Last meeting, we shared the equity tool and um, they were very happy to receive it and um, use it in their mapping of long-term care insurance. So um, we, we need to circle back and see how that's coming out the other side, but they were very appreciative to receive that as a tool. So thank you. Well, thank you, Ken. And that prompts me because I uh, also wanted to share in terms of a member update, Kevin couldn't stay, stay with us, but he wanted us to, sh wanted to share that uh, he's been working with advocates and uh, state leaders in Colorado, uh, and they are aware and uh, very interested in wanting to utilize our tool, our equity tool as a base uh, for de developing their plan as well. So we were thrilled. Um, I believe Kim mentioned that there's no issues in terms of sharing that from the CDA side, uh, but we wanted to bring this to all of you and uh, and and to inform you that uh, I mean, we, you know, that we, that's a compliment. I think to all the, the work that we've been doing. Uh, so we're, we're excited to see that uh, replicated. But of course, open it up if there's anybody, uh, anyone here. Um, any any thoughts about that or any any issues? Uh, certainly, um, want to hear from you at this time. And if not, I also wanted to mention that they are wanting to also give us credit. So as they put that out, they will give credit to the the equity work group uh, that to help to put this you know create the the tool itself. So 
Yeah. So that's great. All right. And the last thing um, is uh, we're looking to uh, you know, develop our agenda for next time. And we want to uh, align the issues that we bring up and represent on based on the master plan for aging uh, major priorities. We are looking at uh, for the uh, December, January meeting to focus on housing. So if anyone uh, has any uh, agenda items that they'd like to share, please feel free to, I believe Amanda, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you would like those to go to you. Any suggestions? Um, Amanda Lawrence, and, um, and you can share those uh, you know, input. Uh, in addition to the, any, you know, related to the MPA, any particular areas that you feel are hot topics as we, you know, discussed today, please make sure you share that and so that we could take those into account and consideration as the agenda is being developed. So with that, I think, um, Kim, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And if I missed anything, please uh, feel free to add on. I see one hand up from Elvira. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I yeah, well, maybe I should just uh, um, write something up and send it to Amanda. I had a thought about, you know, we're talking about different, um, you know, like subpopulations within within older adults. And I, I again, one of my interests and passions is um, farm workers and, 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 and as they age, being exposed to pesticide, a hard labor, um, you know, maybe that's a topic, a subpopulation uh, to include in a future agenda. And um, I'll be happy to maybe just put some notes down and forward to uh, Amanda in the future. That would be great. We have had in the master plan development process that came up in our conversations with Senator Hurtado from Bakersfield and also the <laughs> Secretary of Food and Ag, Karen Ross. So uh, that, may, that may very well be ripe for a return. Thank, Thank you. you. And I see Jax's hand is up and he's also put some uh, information in the in the written chat. So Jax. Hi, bear with me. I think I might have a bad connection, but um, uh, yes, I did put in there that September 18th is National HIV AIDS and Aging Awareness Day. So I just wanted to pe let people be aware of that. There is a, um, a link to a conference that we're having here in Palm Springs, if anyone's interested in attending. Um, it's interesting to be talking about that at this point, since this was the year that uh, SB 258 was passed that includes HIV and, and HIV and Aging Act, which includes HIV positive seniors included in the definition of the greatest social need in aging. Um, and one of the projects that I believe, I'm also on the um, California Planning Group, which is a uh, community advisory board for the uh, California Department of Health's Office of AIDS. And uh, we were working on a, um, uh, we, actually California just passed a $5 million budget for demonstration projects in the state that are based on a program called Golden Compass, which is aged at uh, older, uh, older Californians uh, with HIV. So I understand that there's somebody that's liaison uh, with um, the Department of Aging to work on that with us as well. So. I just wanted to give you guys a heads up on that. So thank you. Excellent. Here we go. Yes, Cheryl. Hi, thank Hi. you. I wanted to just um, briefly tell you, I don't know if I mentioned this before, I am on um, the First Amendment Coalition back and um, really they are newspaper people. However, when I told them about what we were doing with equity, they decided they liked the tool and they liked the glossary. So they are putting it to good use. I just wanted you to know that. Terrific. Thank you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. All right, Kim, so back to you. And let's do public comment. We've still got um, another uh, 30 folks with us who have been listening and I would love to hear from them directly. So we'll open it up for five to 10 minutes of public comment and then end with a uh, We've got a good long list of next steps coming. So thanks Maria for helping with this part. Oh, absolutely. And I'm not able to spotlight myself. I, I don't know if I need to be in front of everybody's face, but um, if I can get some support on that front, that would be great. Um, so turning to public comment, uh, if you submitted a question through Q&A, it might have been responded to. I think uh, I think the committee members did their best, so do check there. 
Um, if you're joining us by phone and you have a comment that you'd like to make, please uh, press star nine and that will add you to the queue. We can unmute your line and we'll call out the last four digits of your phone number uh, just to let you know it's, it's your turn to speak. And then if you're joining by webinar uh, using the Zoom platform, you can use the raise hand icon or you can use the Q&A feature uh, to submit your comment or question. And I um, don't see anything in, in the Q&A and I don't see any raised hands, but I will pause and give folks just a few minutes uh, to, to, um, to jump in there if they'd like to say something. All right, and seeing none, I do want to remind, uh, also do a quick reminder that uh, if you if you happen to think of something uh, right after we adjourn, uh, you can always write engage at aging.ca.gov and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to respond back. And I do see one hand, Cleo Ray. Fantastic. Oh, Cleo, looks like you put your hand down. <laughs> so that might've been an accidental hand raise. Oh, back up. All right. Your line's open, Cleo, but you'll need to unmute. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you. This is my first time attending, and it's very informative, and it makes me feel better as a Black African-American woman that's definitely aged. Um, I, I, I like to see focusing on my needs and the other women that look like me, and we're all just not connected. We don't know what's going on, and so this is made me feel good. I'm going to share the information with all the ladies that I know and all the gentlemen that I know, because we need this. I feel like I'm just a forgotten person. Even with, I know you have committees. Um, I'm concerned with the aging African-American population that's homeless on the streets. I mean, voices, we all have voices, but we all can't be heard. I have insurance, but the way I'm treated, you think I don't. So I have a lot to say that's happened to me. That's my lived experience and I'm connected, but I'm not connected well enough. Thank you very much for this opportunity and I'm coming back. Uh, can we please get Cleo's uh, information? I'd love to have it. Yes, I think we do have contact. Yes, we can. We absolutely. We're glad we're connected here, and we want to deepen that connection. So, Cheryl, we can absolutely provide that, and make sure she has the Sankofa Stories invitation and other um, resources from connections from the meeting. Thank you. 